Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Biology Science Practice 1. What are science practices? Well, there are seven of them, and they're overarching skills and knowledge that you should have to do well as a scientist. Why is that important in an AP Bio class? Well, if you're a teacher, if you're an AP Biology instructor, Practices are skills and knowledge that you want to build in your students throughout the year. And if you're a student, these are the practices that you want to pick up. Because when you take the AP Biology test in the spring, they're going to ask you to apply the knowledge that you've picked up throughout the year using science practices. And so you want to understand what a model and what a visual representation is because it's going to allow you to do better on the test. And it could also allow you to do better as a scientist. And this right here is a picture of DNA. So this is bacterial DNA under an electron microscope. And you might fool yourself into thinking that we're looking at the double helix, that we're looking at DNA, but that's not really what it is. If we zoom in as close as we can see, that's not what we see. In fact, the DNA is wrapped around histone proteins, which are wrapped around more DNA and more histone proteins. And we eventually get to something that looks like this. We call it a fiber of DNA. And that's what you're looking at in this picture. And so it's, re it's weird to think that we've never seen a double helix. We've never seen DNA at this level, especially at this level. And so how do we know that that's what it looks like? Through careful experimentation. Watson and Crick developed a model, and a model is going to allow us to understand how DNA works. It's a visual representation of, of what's going on inside the genetic material of a cell. And so if I were to ask you, think about this. Um, how is uh, the DNA eventually become a protein in a cell? Well, in your brain, you're going to start to come up with all these mental models of how the DNA maybe becomes messenger RNA and then is somehow translated in the cytoplasm. That's your mental model, but it's still not a model. It's still not a visual representation because it's not shared by everyone. And so once we have a picture of how it works, now we're at the level of a conceptual model, and that's what the science practice is really about. And so throughout AP Biology, remember, there are four big ideas that we're going to talk about. Evolution, free energy, information, and then finally systems. And I came up with four models that would be typical in each of these different big ideas. And so if we're talking about evolution, this is a nice model that shows natural selection. So we've got bacteria, we've got a selective process when we're choosing these bacteria, and then this is a final population. And maybe we're thinking about bacteria, and so this is resistance levels. And so the ones that are able to survive are gonna be the ones that have the highest resistance. And so by visually making natural selection um, apparent to us, it's easier to deal with questions. Or let's say we're looking at free energy and how free energy is transferred. This is a nice visual representation of photosynthesis. So it shows the light reaction in the Calvin cycle. It shows the reactants and the products of each. And it also shows these carrier mo molecules of NADPH and ATP. What if we're looking at information flow? Remember that deals with things like genetics and cell communication. This would be a great example of a model. This shows you how an operon works. And so this is going to be our RNA polymerase, and we have a repressor here. Or maybe if we're looking at systems, a great model could be this pyramid of energy showing carnivores, herbivores, and plants. And so this gives you an idea of what a model looks like and how it could be applied in an AP biology class. But they're asking that you can do five things using models and visual representations. And so they first of all want you to be able to create models and representations. And so you can think of each of these questions, here's the first one, like a question you might experience on the AP Biology test in the spring. In other words, they're asking you to apply the knowledge that you've built using a science practice. In this case, you would have to build or create a model or representation. And so you could pause the video, I've got five of these, and you could try to do this, and then you could watch me explain it. And so pause the video now, and let me go through it. So we've got a hypothetical population of beetles, there's wide variation in color, matching the range of coloration of the tree trunks, Create a graph that shows how the beetle population would change as a result in changes in the environment that darken the tree trunks. And so what are some first things that I would look at? So we've got a beetle population. There's differences in color, 
but they're saying that we have a variety of different colors. And so we're going to represent that with a graph. We want to show the frequencies, but we're going to have a normal distribution. In other words, we could put beetle color here along the x-axis from light to dark, and we're going to get a normal distribution. In other words, some of the beetles are really light, some are really dark, but most of them are going to be in the middle. What are they then asking us to do? They want to show us evolution. They want to show us how they're changing as the bark becomes darker and darker. So what's going to happen? Well, as the bark becomes darker and darker, all of these lightly colored beetles are going to die because the birds are going to see them. They're going to show up. And so they're going to die on this side of that curve. And so this would be pre-evolution, and then this would be post-evolution. And so what we're going to see is directional selection. And so it's neat. I can look at that. We now have a visual representation of a concept, and this is what they're getting at. Can you build a model like this? Or if you were given four options in a multiple choice portion, could you choose the one that reflects this hypothetical change? Let's go to the next thing they'd like you to be able to do. They want you to be able to describe a model or a visual representation. Well, here's a question. What will happen to the water molecules in dissolved salts over time? So we have a U-tube over here on the side. You could look right here that we've got water, which is going to be this bluish color, and then we have these dissolved salts. And so they're going to ask you what would happen over time. One other piece of evidence is that we've got a semi-permeable membrane down here. What does that mean? It's only going to allow certain things through. In this case, it's only going to allow water to go through. So what would happen over time? Well, we're now dealing with um, diffusion. And so these salt molecules are going to be randomly bouncing around, and they would always want to move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. They would always want to move from the left side of the U-tube to the right side of the U-tube. But they can't because there's a semi-permeable membrane here. And so the water is the only thing that can move. So let's look at the water now. Well, the water is going to have a higher concentration of water on the right side than the left side. And so the water is going to start flowing through this semi-permeable membrane. So the level of the water would magically move up on this side, and it's going to move down on this side. How long is it going to do that until the concentration of salt molecules to water molecules is going to be the same on either side? Now, does the water stop moving? No, it's still going to move back and forth. It's just that it's going to be at an equilibrium. So you can see now that I'm giving you a model, and then I'm asking you to describe the model or what's going to happen over time. The third thing they want you to be do, able to do in this science practice is to refine a model or a representation. So they could give you a model, and then they could ask you questions based on that. So I've got a model over here to the right, and what I'm asking is how will changes in the messenger RNA sequence affect the properties of the newly born protein? Okay, now I'm asking you to refine the model that I've given you. And so right here you can see that we've got translation going on. So we have messenger RNA, it's moving through a ribosome, and as it does, we've got our tRNA. So the tRNA, which is going to be this molecule right here, is going to arrive at the A site, and it's going to contribute its one amino acid. And so that would be just describing this model, but they want you to refine it. In other words, what would happen if we would change the messenger RNA sequence? Well, if we change that sequence here, it's going to change the amino acids that come in, and therefore it's going to change the proteins. What's going to happen if we change the proteins? We'll remember, or excuse me, the amino acids. Every amino acid is going to be the same except for the R group that hangs off the side. And so if we change those R groups, we're going to change the, the uh, chemical interactions between all those R groups, and so we're going to get a protein that folds differently. In other words, its secondary and tertiary structure is going to be different. And so now I'm not answering a question based on this model. I'm saying if we could refine it, um, what else do I know? Next thing they want you to be able to do is use models and representations. And so right here they're saying the diagram to the right shows transduction in bacteria. How does genetic variation in bacteria result from this process? So they're going to ask you to use the model. Um, in this case, we've got a bacteriophage. Remember, it's a, it's a virus that's infecting a bacteria. But that's not what the question is about. They're asking you to say how that would affect the genetic variation in the bacteria. Now remember, bacteria don't have sex. They don't do meiosis and produce sperm or eggs, and so how could we get variation in it? Well, let's look what's going on. So the bacteria is injected with DNA from the bacteriophage. That's basically programming that bacteria to make more viruses. 
except there's one thing going on right here. At this point, instead of this virus being packaged with viral DNA that's created by the bacteria, it's packaged with bacterial DNA. And so as these viruses spread out, this one virus is injecting bacterial DNA into another bacteria. So it's transferring DNA from one bacteria to another. What is that going to give that new bacteria? It's going to give it variation. And so again, I'm applying my knowledge to a model or a visual representation. And then the last one is we need to be able to re-express models and representations. And so in this one, we're looking at signal transduction. So you can see right here that we've got an insulin receptor and then we've got glut or we've got a glucose transport. So what's the question asking? How can changing key elements of signal transduction alter cellular response? And so again, now they're asking you to apply the knowledge that you have. In this case, why is insulin important? Insulin is going to dock with an insulin receptor, but what it's really going to open up are going to be these glucose transports. In other words, it's going to open up this gate, and so glucose can get into the cell. And so what are some questions we could ask from that? Well, let's say there's no insulin. If there's no insulin here, there's going to be no signal transduction, and it's not going to open up, and it's not going to allow glucose to come in. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, if you don't have insulin, then you're out of luck. But let's say you're a type 2 diabetic. Where's the problem going to be there? Now we've got a problem with the insulin receptor itself. We're creating insulin, but it's not docking properly with the insulin receptor. What's that going to do? We still don't have a signal transduction. We still don't have a glucose transport opening up. And so again, these are all questions that you might find on an AP biology test in the spring. In other words, they're asking you to use models, create models, but models are neat. They allow us to make sense of a mental model. And lots of times it gets visual and it gets much easier to understand. And they're used by scientists. What's the most famous model of all? That model was developed by James Watson and Francis Crick right here. They're shaking hands with McCarty, who was one of the scientists who had figured out that it was DNA that was actually doing transforming inside bacteria, but they were able to build a model. They were able to be a, build a model because they knew what DNA was made up of. They knew that it was made up of phosphates, sugar, and then these nitrogenous bases. They knew the ratio of the bases, but until they could physically build it, they couldn't visualize it. And so models and visual representations are incredibly important in AP biology. It'll help you do better on the test, and I hope that was helpful.